Okay, so I'm gonna leave this with you for a little while. I'm not in a huge hurry, but I do need to have it a little bit on a budget. We might be able to figure something out. I think I got an idea. Dude, are you kidding me? That's what I'm saying. I need some help. You got an E30 M3. Yep, and it needs some help. I gotta look at this. What's your plans with it? Well, obviously I'm gonna take care of most of the powertrain, but I need somebody to kind of do everything else. <laughs> now I see where this is going. <laughs> right, that okay. could be a fair trade. I think so. I mean, I mean, this is like an iconic car. It's one of my favorites and I would love to uh, work with you on this. Well, perfect. So I think we can work that out. Sounds yeah. like a plan to me. Definitely, man. Appreciate it. That's gonna be cool. I'm excited. Hey guys, we're at Fountain Race Engines. We got Mike here. He's gonna help us with the Chris Fix engine, get it all machined up. We're gonna go through the process, show you guys how that's, you know, what's involved in all that. So let's go. It's hard to believe that an engine block can be distorted after installing and torquing down a cylinder head, but that is exactly what happens. For this reason, a torque plate is used. A torque plate essentially replaces the cylinder head. We use the head gasket, we use the factory bolts, we torque it down as if we were actually installing the head. Because those cylinder heads get a little distorted, we end up honing the cylinders perfectly round. This way, when we install the cylinder head and torque it down, everything will be perfectly round and in spec. Now, Mike did hone the cylinders and he took out about five thousandths of material. And because of that, we ended up buying pistons that are five thousandths larger. That way everything matches perfectly. After honing the cylinders, Mike decks the block, meaning he takes a thin layer of material off the top and made it perfectly flat. He only removed about two thousandths, which is less than a human hair. He then deburs any sharp edges and then we put it into the wash tank. This thing uses hot soapy water, sprayed at really high pressures. Think of a dishwasher on steroids for engine parts. This thing is awesome. And Mike was nice enough to let me throw in some extra parts that I brought with me to help me save some cleaning time. Thanks, Mike. All right, this crankshaft is internally balanced, which means it has all these counterweights. And if it is out of balance, it's gonna use the drill. It's gonna drill a hole out of it and take some weight out of it. However, not all engines are internally balanced, which is why it does not have the harmonic balancer on it where if you're balancing a V10 engine, let's say out of an Audi or a Lamborghini, he does those a lot here, and that will require the damper. However, this one does not. I know a lot of you guys might be asking that question. So this is gonna be your front. So I programmed it to say, where is this counterweight at? So it knows that the counterweight that we're gonna be drilling on is here. So this amount you would take off right here if you wanted to do it perfect at 252 degrees. So bring it up to 252 and you need to take off weight here. Oh, but you're not going to be able to drill there, so you would yeah, you either you would either add weight over here, which is only 5.5 grams, yeah, or you'd start grinding off like this little nub right here and this little nub right here. But it's such a minimal amount that it's yeah. Well, I mean, two grams. The crankshaft passed the balance test, and now we're moving on to the cylinder head. This is the machine that's going to make the cylinder head completely flat for a tight seal to the engine. Mike is measuring everything here with a dial caliper. Then he runs the machine across, taking off just a thousandth of material at a time. He brushes on this bluish purple paint that will show any low spots after the final pass. He runs it through the test, and when it's all done, it comes out perfectly clean with no paint, meaning there's no low spots, which is exactly what we want. Now let's get it cleaned. All right, now it's time to do some work on the cylinder head. He already washed it, went through the wash tank, so it's nice and clean. He checked the guides. They're marginal. They don't technically need to be replaced, but they are kind of on that borderline level. So we're gonna go ahead and just put all new guides in it anyway. So I've already got them, so may as well put them in. There's no real fancy way of getting the valve guides out. So Mike uses an air hammer with an attachment and basically forces them out. Once the new valve guides are installed, it'll also get new valve seals. Before the intake and exhaust valves are put into the new valve guides, Mike grinds the valves to ensure that they'll be airtight to the cylinder head when the valves are closed. He uses a grinding wheel to cut the valves at the perfect angle. Between you and me, he may or may not have put an extra back cut on the valves for improved airflow. If you're an engine geek like me, you're going to appreciate this next part where we blueprint the engine. Basically, that means we measure all the clearances to ensure we have the most reliable engine. So prepare to geek out. Okay guys, obviously we're back at my shop. Uh, I got Mike here from the machine shop. He's gonna help us go through here and I'm gonna teach him a few things. 
Okay, he's going to teach me a few things. He's going to teach you guys a few things. Uh, we're going to get a little nitty and gritty on this. We're going to build the bottom end, and that way he's going to and he's going to show me some cool things and show you guys some cool things, and hopefully we all learn something. Give it a shot. We'll give it a shot. All right. So the first thing we're doing is we're going to check ring end gap. I would imagine they give you like the rings that come in the kit are a little bit longer, knowing that you're going to yes. trim them down. Yes. Usually they at least fit in the bore, but you know nowadays with what they have going on with shipping and everything, they kind of just give you whatever works. And a lot of times they overlap like this, which is no big deal. It's just a little bit more work to grind them into size. Okay, cool. So we got three rings. Uh, top ring is your compression ring. Center one is your oil ring. The bottom is your oil control ring. Correct. So real quickly for those that may not know the difference, when you have your piston. And you have your three rings on there. The very top one, the compression, does seals compression. Seals compression, right? Yep. Self-explanatory. The oil ring is scraping the oil, scraping the oil off the bore, yep. off the bore. And Keep then the up. oil control ring, um, you were showing me earlier. The pistons have these little holes in here that feed oil up through the oil control ring, right? And then the, basically the oil squirts out the side. Correct. And it keeps the piston skirt. Skirt and really the bore and everything all lubricated. All lubricated. Yep, it just distributes nicely all around the whole bore and keeps that lubricated. And then the reason we have cross hatches is because that's what keeps the extra oil, right? Just kind of in the hatches. Correct. If that, it was perfectly smooth cylinder with no hatches, what, what would happen? It would wear all the rings out right away because there's nothing lubricating it. You know, it'd just be like in there just grinding away metal to metal and there's nothing that's going to keep it happy. And we were talking earlier off camera on uh, the cross hatches. So I always thought 45 degrees was kind of like the desirable angle, like the cross hatch angle. But you were talking on a race engine, it should be more of like a 15 to 20 degree angle. Yeah, the, the like more this. you lay it down, the more it's going to seal compression better because when the rings lays across it, it has a longer path for the compression to come through. So, you know, if your compression has to go like this, it's a real short path. Or if it's like this, it has a long path to go through. So the, when you're trying to seal compression, you want it laid way down. Gotcha. And um, if you guys hear any noises, we're at the shop today and they are working. So I apologize for any noise, outside noise that you might hear. And you, you did this one at what, about a 20 degree hat? hat? Yeah, around 20 to 25, somewhere in there. Okay, so not complete race, but we're in a pretty healthy, healthy spot. Correct. It. And then um, we machined this surface down about two thousandths, about two which thousand. is about the size of a human hair. Or a little less. Or a little less. And then the cylinder head, which is going to go on top, you also machined. Correct. So when you put the two together, you're going to have less space, obviously, between the piston and the valves. Just a little. And so my question was, how much is that going to play with interference? None. On these stock engines, the cams, there's so much space in between piston and the valve that none of that's ever going to come into play. The only thing you'd ever have to worry about, possibly, is the piston coming out of a hole too far and hitting the cylinder head. But for four thousandths that we cut off of this, that's not going to be. These engines are not made that tight from the factory. So less than a hair on here, less than a hair on the cylinder head. Change. All together, you're a hair and a half of, <laughs> of uh, thickness. Correct. And, and how much compression, extra compression would you see? Very minimal. Like a hair, a hair more? I would say you'd be good at a hair more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a little a hair more compression. Okay, got it. Cool. Okay, so I guess let's get busy and show us the process and how you uh, do the ring. So cylinder number one, obviously we put it in here, which it's, it's an overlap. So we're going to have to cut this ring back in order to where we can get it in there square and measure the gap. I brought my machine to cut it back some, but we have a guide that we kind of go off of. Yeah, so I saw the guide and there's high performance street and they have drag racing and nitrous and nitrous with more than 200 horsepower. And then they've got turbocharged, supercharged, diesel. So it looks like they're based on temperature. And as you go down to the turbocharged and higher performance engines, the gap is getting bigger and bigger. Correct. Is the more heat you put in this ring, anytime you put heat into any type of metal, it's going to expand. Well, we have the bore holding it there. So if it expands, it's going to close up the gap. Well, if the gap closes up, the point where the ends touch, then it's got nowhere else to go other than out. So it's either going to break the piston, break the bore, wear everything out. So you have to make sure that that clearance is in there. And you don't want it so big to where you allow compression to go through or oil to come up. So that's kind of where you figure out where you're going to be at and you size it accordingly. 
So you're going to try to get it as perfect as possible without getting it to touch. Correct. And you were telling me before, if it's too tight, everybody knows. And if it's too loose, if it's nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> so we're, we want to err on the side of loose. Correct. Okay, gotcha. All right, well, let's go ahead and get the first one sized up. When it comes to measuring piston rings, it can be a little tedious, but it's absolutely necessary. So I take it over to the grinding wheel, the dial gauge tells me exactly how much I need to take off, then I knock off any burrs with the grinding stone because we don't want any sharp edges scoring the cylinder. I may have to do this two or three times to get the exact measurement. I use the piston ring squaring tool to push the ring into the cylinder, and then I use my feeler gauge to check the clearance. If I need to take off more material, then it's back to the grinding wheel. I do this for the compression ring, the oil scraping ring for all the cylinders. Mike is gonna show us how to measure the clearance of the wrist pin. It's the same setup as the main bearings, as the rod bearings. Um, and, and the main journals. Basically, we're gonna use a micrometer. He's gonna measure the, the thickness of this, and we're gonna compare it to the inside diameter of the piston and also the inside diameter of the uh, rod. So Mike's gonna show us how to get that set up. So we're gonna take our wrist pin here. We're gonna grab our micrometer. We're gonna open it up. And we'll measure the OD. We're gonna use the friction stop on the end. Friction stop is there so it's the exact same every time, the exact same tension or torque on the uh, caliper itself. It's kind of like a, like a torque wrench. It's always the same. So that way you're not over torquing it and giving you a false reading from time to time. And this one comes right in at 866, right on the nose, which I believe is 22 millimeters. Go ahead and lock that down. So that's going to keep that outside diameter right at 866. And we're going to grab our bore gauge. We're going to get this guy set up here. We're going to use our smallest one. There's three different sizes in this kit. Give that a light snug. We're going to refer to our how to set it up because it takes different anvils to go in the ends to get for different measurements because it measures a bunch of different sizes. So you're looking at a reference sheet? Reference sheet on how to set up the bore gauge, what different anvils and different um, spacers to use to get that measurement within the range of the gauge. Yeah, because that's a fine measurement. Very, very fine measurement. So seeing that we're 866, this gives you the different ranges of the gauge. So we need to be between 823 and 870 is how we're going to set it up. So we're going to grab the number two anvil, and then we're going to add a two and a four spacer to it. So I would imagine most people are just, you got new pistons, new wrist pins, and they just kind of slap it together, and hope for the best, and put the engine together. Put it together. Nowadays, you know, back two, three years ago, quality was a lot closer, but with how manufacturing is now, things seem to get kicked out the door a lot faster yeah. and a lot of this stuff gets overlooked. So it's not uncommon that you have to go through and rehone either a piston or a rod or let's say one of these wrist pins are made a little bit too big or too small and you have to coat something. So it's always good to check everything so that way you're not ever doing the you know, yeah. fingers crossed type of deal. Measure twice, cut once. There you go. So now that we got the actual end set up down here, we're going to go ahead and set up the top side of the gauge so that we're going to put the zero mark on the gauge right to the exact size of our wrist pin. So whatever we measure here will be our clearance that's inside the piston and the rod. So again, this is the exact size of the wrist pin. So I was trying to get this one set up the other day and I had a hard time holding that and zeroing this out. So I guess you just kind of figure out where the needle is and then just move your zero to that. Exactly. Right. So we just, you mean to turn it? Yeah, if we keep sweeping it to the highest position, and then we zero out the gauge right on a little bit more. Give it a little, just give it a little tap. So now the gauge at zero is set to the exact size of our wrist pin. <clears throat> so when we go in, and we if this measures exactly zero, when we put it in, let's just say, the rod, then we'll know that there's no clearance at all. Anything that comes up on the gauge is going to be what our clearance is. Makes sense. All right, so you want to do the piston first? Or the... Let's go ahead and grab a rod. That'll be... Go ahead and check that. And right now that comes up to right at six tenths clearance, which on a stock engine, about right where we want to be. Seems that this engine is a used engine. It does, it is a little out of round. And if it was way out of round, you would hone, hone that. We would hone the rod, correct. Gotcha. And if it was tight, we would hone the rod. Now, if it was too loose, they do make oversized wrist pins and thousands increments. So you can get a, that's an 866 pin. We could get an 867 pin and then just size everything accordingly. Now these are the Molly pistons. I always call them Molly. I think they're- Could be called Molly. Molly, Mall. <laughs> I don't know. How do you guys pronounce it? Molly is how I've always pronounced it. And these are forged pistons and they're oversized by, do you remember how much? 
uh, five thou, which would be, I think, an eighth of a millimeter. All right, so five thousandths over the factory, factory size. size. And that's what we hone the block, block out, right? Five thousand. And it looks like the uh, piston has around eight tenths in it, which is still within spec. And it looks like it's nice and round as well. Obviously, it should be because these are brand new pistons. So we'll go through and we'll measure the other five and the other five rods. We'll write everything down so we have all those specifications on our build sheet and move on to the next step. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. So uh, talking to Mike, he wanted to do a test and I really like the idea of this test. So in the past, you guys maybe have seen a video where I did a, a E90 rod bearings and I used ARP bolts. Uh, I did an E46 bearings and I used factory bolts. Well, Mike wants to know the difference between using an ARP bolt versus a factory bolt because hypothetically, if you're using an ARP bolt, it's a better fastener and it's got a tighter clamping force. So if you tighten here and here, you're going to get a, what do you call it? A distortion. Distortion of the bore. Correct. So it may not be a perfect circle and you may not have an oval shaped. So we're going to test that theory and see how it works. Now you're building twin turbo Lamborghini engines. So you're always using. Yeah, we always use high quality fasteners and anytime we change from a factory fastener to a high quality fastener as ARP, we remachine the bores because it distorts it, it changes it, and that changes your bearing clearance. Exactly, now if you're doing a regular bearing service in a car, you're not pulling the engine apart and, re and resizing the, the rods because you'd have to pull the whole engine apart, right? Exactly. So, you, so when people are using these ARP bolts, and, I, and we've used them, we've never really had a problem with them, but I'd like to see, I'm really curious to see how this test exactly. is gonna turn out. I so, think it'll be interesting. Okay, well let's, let's do that. Uh, okay, so to do that test, we're going to put it in a vise. We're going to clamp it down to the factory specs, one with ARP, another with factory using the same rod. We're going to install the bearings. Same bearing, correct. And we're going to measure it, right? We're going to measure it, yep. Just the same way we did the wrist pins, we're going to do the rod bearings. All right, we got the rod in the vise, and we're going to, I got these finger tight now, but we're going to tighten them down five newton meters each, and then 20 newton meters, and we're going to do 70 degrees. That's the torque sequence from the factory to do the torque to yield bolts. I've got this really nice um, diagram here written out to factory specifications. I mean, this is actually true diagram here. As you can see, the factory rod bearings, uh, the top half, bottom half, and ARP, we're going to measure them, and we're going to figure out exactly uh, the differences between the two. So let's get this tightened down. Let's measure it out and see what we've got. Okay, we've got them tightened down. Why don't you go ahead and measure those out. Tell me what you got. Let's see what this looks like here. This is with factory bolts. This is top to bottom, right? Top to bottom, we're at two and a half, point zero zero two five. Little no taper, so that's good. Okay. Come over here at the parting line, which is about point zero zero two six. Six to seven. Which one? Zero zero two seven. Seven will go seven. Then at the opposite one, we're at point zero zero two nine. Overall, not too bad. Nice and round, and yeah, about nice. the right clearance. Nice and round. Okay, so let's take these out. Now we can't use these bolts, so once I've used them, we've now got to throw them away. That's okay. I'll order new bolts if we need to. We'll see how the ARPs hold up. The ARPs we can technically reuse. We have to use oil to torque down the factory bolts. The ARP uses uh, their own grease or fastener assembly, they say, so it's on the shoulder here and it's on the threads. I went ahead and cleaned all the oil off the old one with brake cleaner, so now we're going in. So it says if you do not have a stretch gauge to torque it to 36 foot-pounds, but we do have a stretch gauge and we are going to measure it with a stretch gauge. And the spec for the stretch gauge is 0 0.007 to 0 0.0075. So probably want to torque it down to like, it doesn't really give us a torque. So let's say 30 foot pounds, and then let's check it from there. Okay, we've got the stretch gauge on there. Basically we're measuring the uh, bolt before we torque it down. Just kind of, it's just kind of finger tight in there. We're gonna zero the gauge out right about there. And after we torque it down, we want to see it stretched to where the markings are here. So about between seven and seven and a half thousandths. So now that we got it zeroed, let's lock this down. And torque the bolt and see where we're at. So these use a 10 millimeter 12 point socket. You know, everybody knows a joke about 10 millimeters. Literally, the only 10 <laughs> 12 point socket that I could find that was 10 millimeter was a half inch. So I'm using my half inch uh, torque wrench here to torque it down to about 30 foot pounds, and then we'll check the stretch. 
I'm going to do a little bit on each side, then we'll kind of make it even. It's about 15. Now we're getting about 25. Let's do this one about 25. All right, that's about 30. 30. Okay, let's measure the stretch. Okay, so we are not quite there. So we're only two and a half thousandths. Okay, so what we're gonna do is increments by, what do you say, about five foot pounds probably? Yes, I would, I would loosen it. Loosen it and then go back yeah, to 35. It take it right to 35, yep. Good idea. You never wanna loosen a bolt with your torque wrench. That's why I changed ratchets here. All right, so now let's put this back on the torque wrench. Now we'll go to 35 foot pounds. Okay, almost there, there we go. Getting there. Okay, loosen it up, let's go to 40 pounds, 40 foot pounds. So this is interesting, right? They said 36 foot pounds if you don't have a stretch gauge. So that was 35 and we weren't even close. Okay, see where we are. Five thousandths. Keep going. Now we'll go to 45. All right, now we're gonna bump it up to 45 foot pounds. 45, 45, exactly. Oh, we're close. Not quite there, right? Five, we're at six, about six thousandths. What was our range? Seven, seven, seven to seven and a half, right in between those little markings roughly. Okay, we'll back it off and do 50 foot pounds. It's interesting that they told you to put it at 36 if you don't have a stretch gauge. So I guess everybody would be under torquing it. I'd go to 48 and probably 48. Yeah. Okay, let's do that because we're getting close. Yes quite a bit for that fastener. Yeah. 48, okay, let's see where we are. You think this is it? I think it's gonna be real close, right on the low side. And where are we at? We Five, are six and a half. Yeah, about six and a half. Let's go ahead and check that. You wanna check it where it is now? Yes. Okay. So, you know, you got all these specs and numbers and machining and you and I were talking about this before. It's very much an art, kind of a flat, more of a, of a feel, right? So it we is, went to yes. 48 foot pounds instead of the 36 they recommend, but the stretch is still a little less than recommended. All right, so go ahead and go ahead and check and see where we're at. I'm going to write down the stretch. Two and a half still on top to bottom, right? Okay. Yep. And over at the parting line, well, we're still right at two and a half. Wow, okay. And on the other parting line, we're at 2.8. So we might have tightened her up maybe, what, a tenth? Actually, it's better than the factory. We're yeah. at 2.9, yep. the factory. Yeah, tightened it up a little bit more, which, I mean, typically on the stock stuff, for oil clearance, you want a thousandth per inch of shaft diameter, which I think this was inch 700. So usually we want around seven tenths, and then on race stuff, you usually add an extra half a thou, so we'd be around 13 or 23, I mean, and we're at 25, so yeah, that's plenty enough clearance in there, and the ARP actually tightened it up to make it a little nicer. So I would say that would be good to run. So let's run the ARPs. Let's run the ARPs. Nice, okay, cool. That was an interesting test. It was. That. I thought it was going to be a little different outcome, but there you have it. Were you, what were you thinking? You think factory was going to be a better uh, spec? I thought factory was going to be rounder and the ARP was going to make it tighter and out of round. Maybe but if we went to the full stretch, it would? It's possible. So It's very possible. So maybe that's what we'll do the spec at and we'll just do... Um, Try to take it up when we go and a half, the, yep. Six and a half thousandths on the stretch. Yeah, because there's plenty enough oil clearance in there. Yeah. And also it might be because these are really small fasteners, so it might not change it as much as the bigger fasteners that we're, that I'm typically used to seeing. So that might have a role to play in it as well. Cool, awesome. That's a good test. All right. Definitely. Let's, let's get back to putting this together then.
The pistons that we're installing are Molly pistons. They are forged pistons and they are directional. So they got a little arrow right here that's pointing to the front of the engine when you install it. Now these, I've already put in the wrist pin locks, which is, they call it the lock. Basically it's this ring here that fits into a groove on the other side. And what it does, it keeps the wrist pin from falling out because I heard that's pretty bad. Now, when we install the, the rings, we're gonna do our first one, which is the oil control ring. So the oil control ring, you have your spring, wave ring, or whatever you wanna, however you wanna call that. And then this goes on the bottom and this goes on the top. The way you do it is you start with this one. You're gonna find it, it goes into the very bottom ridge. Now, you'll also see that when we install these, there's a little gap in between each ring. And when we stack them on there, you do not want the gaps on the same. Instead, you want to offset them. So it just keeps uh, the compression. Now they do rotate in the engine as it's running. Eventually they'll kind of cross over, but either way, just for good practice, that's how we're going to do it. So the first thing that goes on is your wave spring. I call it the wave spring. I don't even know if that's accurate. Okay. And then this is going to go on the bottom side of it. I'm gonna kind of fit it in here like that. Rotate it around. No, oh, come on. These are very kind of flimsy, not very rugged like the compression or the oil scraping ring. You bring this all the way down. You wanna make sure not to scratch the side of the piston. That's very important. Okay, good. Now we're gonna put the other one in, which is on top. Kind of making like a wave sandwich. All right, now that we got them all together, sandwiched in, kind of make sure I got enough play here and everything feels just fine. It's not binding or anything like that. The next ring, this one here, this was the one that's scraping the oil. So as the, think of it like a windshield wash or a windshield wiper on a windshield. So as the piston comes down, this is scraping the wall. And as it goes up, this is lubricating it again and it just repeats. Now this is very important. <laughs> this is a beveled edge and it has a little dimple on it right here. Uh, right there, it's kind of hard to see. There it is, right here. This is very, very, very important. This dimple has to face up when you install it. Because of the beveled edge, and it's scraping and pushing the oil down, if I flip this up, instead it's going to shove that oil up. And it's gonna push the oil into the combustion chamber and you're gonna be smoking like a pig if that happens. So we're going to make sure that that bevel is up. I do it, we're gonna check it two times, once now, and then just as a double check precaution, when we before we put this in, we're just gonna kind of push the ring out. Let me show you on this piston, it's already assembled. We can kind of push it out here, and we're just going to verify that we can see the dimple, like that one right there. And then this one as well. This one has some writing on it, it's gonna be the same principle, it also faces up. So let's go ahead and get this little guy installed. And again, we're gonna do these 180 out from each other. So you're gonna stick it in here just like that. Make sure it's a nice solid fit. Make sure the, the thickness of it, or the width of it, I should say, um, is not wider than the groove. It all looks good. So we're gonna pick it up here. Now this is a little bit uh, stronger than the oil control rings. So you wanna make sure that you're not scraping or scratching the side of the piston. So I'm pulling it out away from the piston, the side walls of the piston. I'm gonna set it right into the groove like that. There we go. Okay, so you can see the, the opening is here. So I'm not going to put this opening here. Instead, we're gonna put this opening this way. Make sure it's facing the right orientation. Okay, I can see the numbers, so it's facing up. So we're going to do this. We're gonna do the exact same thing, kind of fit it in like that. It feels good, looks good. We're gonna rotate this around. Now they do have piston ring pliers, but these are so easy to install, just they're not needed. Okay, and like that, we have piston rings. Okay, so now we're going to install our rod. Now the rod, I believe these are symmetrical. I don't know if they matter going forward or not uh, facing the engine. Just as a precaution, there's no markings on there that say it. So just as a precaution, I marked each uh, rod like this, and that was before I disassembled it. So that way I know that that's the forward facing part of the engine. 
So just to go back the same way as it came out, that's what we're gonna do. We're going to lube the small end bore of the rod. Get that, all right. We're also gonna lube the piston bores. Okay, and there's no need to lube the uh, wrist pin. So I've already put the lock on this side. Now remember, we got the arrow, it's facing this way. That's the front of the engine. I also want that paint mark facing the front of the engine. So that's the front, that's the front, good. Get those lined up. And they just go in just like that. Now on the older engines where they're press fit into the rod, you would have to actually heat up the rod and then put the pin in. These are a true floating piston, so everything free, moves freely, which is a much better design. And then last thing is to put your final lock. When I installed the other side before the wrist pin was in, it was very important that we don't scratch the bore side of the piston. Okay, so now that it's in, we have a piston and rod, but there's a couple things we need to check. I'm gonna squeeze the wrist pin and make sure that the rod rotates independently of the wrist pin. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with the piston. I'm gonna make sure the piston can rotate independently of that. I also wanna make sure there's a little bit of play back and forth, that feels pretty good. And some play here. So that's a fully floating free assembly. Okay, that's all done. We'll do the rest and we'll get them installed. Now it's time to measure the main bearing clearance. I install the main bearing caps with the bearings and torque it down as if the crankshaft was in place. Well, since the crankshaft isn't there, I have access to measure the bores with the dial bore gauge, just like we did with the rod bearings. I'm having a really hard time measuring these last three main bearings because when I put the tool in there, I need it to be absolutely perfectly perpendicular to get the actual accurate measurement, but it's hitting the engine, so I need to measure it from this side. Well, I can't measure it from this side right now because the engine stand is in a way. So I'm gonna pull the engine off the engine stand. We're gonna put it up on the uh, bench here and get a better measurement. When you look at the gauge, so from zero, you have a small, a small dash and then a bigger dash. The bigger dash is one thousandths. So where the needle's pointing now is two thousandths. And that is our tolerance between one and two thousandths. So we're within tolerance there. So when I sweep it like that, you want to get the where the needle comes closest to the zero is the measurement you're going to take. Now, if I measure the side, so if I'm going to turn this, now I'm measuring this way, and we're going to take the, the measurement that the needle gets closest to the zero. So we are right about there is one, two, three and a half thousandths. So you're thinking, man, that's a pretty large difference, right? Three and a half thousandths from two thousandths, which is what our spec is. Well, why is there such a large difference? In the bearing, when you're measuring side to side, it actually, the bearings account for that. It's called delta. Don't know why they call it delta, it's called delta, but basically, once the engine goes through its heat cycle and it warms up, uh, that bearing will take shape and it'll become round. So that's not to be, you don't really have to worry too much about that, but the, uh, the vertical measurement from the 12 o'clock to the six o'clock position, that's the one that we have, that's the one that's really important. That's the one we have to make sure that we have right. All right, it's time for the oil squirters. We just put on some blue Loctite onto the threads. These oil squirters actually have a check valve built into them. And when the oil pressure gets high enough, it'll open up that check valve and it'll start spraying oil into the bottom of the pistons. Mike was telling me that in a lot of the Lamborghini builds that he does, they actually block off the oil squirters and they don't allow the oil to hit the bottom of the piston because it's, it apparently uses up some, it frees up some horsepower by not using the piston squirters. So we debated not using these and I didn't want to try that out on this engine. So, <laughs> but it was an interesting theory. I'm just going to start these all by hand and then I'll go through and I'll give them a final torque. And these will get torqued to feel <laughs> because I don't know the exact torque spec, but these aren't exactly required to be particular torque. It's not gonna damage the engine, so I'll do it by feel. Probably be around 10 newton meters. Oil comes out of the main bearing, so there's this groove here with these holes, and it squirts into the main journal. So this journal right here has a hole in it, 
and there's a straight hole that goes all the way through the crank and into the, the journal for the rod. So the oil feeds the bearing, it feeds the rod, and this journal feeds this rod, this main feeds this one, this feeds that one, that, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. You guys get the idea. So I made sure that I cleaned each one of these holes with brake clean and make sure that it was free of debris or any carbon and they're all super clean. I've already cleaned all the journals. So now we're gonna lubricate these bearings and then we'll set the crank in place. I'm making sure I have the crankshaft in the correct orientation. I need to be very careful here and align the crankshaft with the bearings and not to scratch the journal. Easy, good. Okay, we've got these marked one through seven, not because there's seven cylinders, but because there's seven main caps. And seven faces the front like this. We're gonna go ahead and lube this, lube this just like the other ones. The arrow faces the front of the engine. All right. Number six, this one is your thrust bearing. So you see it's got the extra on the side here. This is what we're gonna check that for thrust play once this is all installed, which is basically the forward and back movement of the crankshaft. All right, the main bolts get a little bit of oil here, here, which is where the shoulder of the bolt goes and on the threads. Because when you torque these down, you want to have as little friction as possible. So we're using 30 weight oil. The main cap torque spec is 20 Newton meters, then 70 degrees, starting in the middle and working out from there. But first, I need to check the end play of the crankshaft. To do this, the bolts are only torqued to 20 Newton meters. Then I loosen the two thrust bearing cap fasteners only. I grab a rubber mallet and I whack the back of the crankshaft to slide it forward. Then I go to the front and whack it again to slide it back. Then I give it two more whacks from the backs to center up the thrust bearing. I'll torque the bolts back to 20 Newton meters. Oh yeah, that feels nice. Yeah, if I couldn't spin this by hand, then something would be bound up and this feels good. We're gonna to torque 70 degrees, but I'm gonna be marking the tops of these bolts with a paint pen. So I'm gonna clean them off with brake clean just so the, they're not oily. Okay, we're gonna start from the inside and work our way out. 70 degrees, it's already there, good. All torqued and it still feels really nice. And these little guys get torqued to 22 newton meters. You can see some of the bolts missing here. No, I didn't forget them. That's actually for the windage tray, but that doesn't get installed until after the pistons are installed, which we're gonna do right now. I put the crankshaft of cylinders one and six at bottom dead center to give me enough clearance for the piston installation. I also lube the cylinder walls with some engine oil. Using the piston ring compressor, it's time to install the piston assembly and I'm very careful here not to scratch the cylinder walls with the rod ends. I slowly push the piston into the cylinder with my thumbs until the piston skirt is in the bore. Then I use the handle end of my BFH to knock the piston into the cylinder. This is a little nerve wracking because the piston ring compressor tool needs to stay square onto the deck while tapping the piston in. If it lifts, I run the risk of the piston ring popping out before it's fully inserted into the cylinder, causing damage to the block, the piston, or the ring. Now with the crank shaft at bottom dead center, it makes it way easier for me to install the rod caps. The ARP bolts are lubed and finger tightened for now. You can see Joey in the back helping me out. He's the lube guy and he installs the rod caps while, while I install the rest of the pistons. Uh, when I was doing the test and we put the uh, fastener assembly lube on there, you know, we'd loosened it, tightened it, loosened it, tightened it, and I felt like maybe the lube wasn't quite as lubricant. As, as slippery or whatever you want to call it, the lub lubricity of it. I don't even know if that's a word or not. But uh, anyway, I re -lubed the bolts and then we tightened them down and it was within spec. When I went back and redid the rest of the rods to check all the tor torqueness of it, 
I backed the gauge off to 40 foot pounds. And at 40, I was at six and a half, or I mean seven and a half, between seven, seven and a half thousandths, which is where they want it. So, and that was at 40 foot pounds. So I don't want to jump up. So I think I'm going to back it off even more. So let's see where we are at 36 foot pounds, which is what the instructions say to use it at and measure it. So before we do our first measurement, let's just start with cylinder four. Okay. And then I'm going to check both sides because not every bolt is equal. Some a little longer. However, these two are the same. 36 foot pounds. 36, 36. We are right at 7,000, it's like perfect. We are five, six, seven, just over 7,000. Right in spec, good. We got the bottom end assembled. I'm really happy with the way it went together. It went super smooth. I have all these parts behind me. We got to get those in and we may be tweaking some stuff along the way to make it more efficient. You'll have to see that in the next video. So thank you guys for watching.